So if you want to be irresistible, you need to come up with a problem that you're solving that makes people feel like, I gotta have it. The fear of missing out is what's gonna kick in. The old way of selling is to push your message out. That's what commercials do. They interrupt your programming. Even an ad in a magazine is pushing. But when you tell a story, you pull people in. People go from listening to data in their left brain to, oh, you're gonna tell me a story? Oh, maybe it'll be interesting, maybe even entertaining. The person who tells the best stories becomes irresistible because when you are irresistible, you're tugging at people's heartstrings and that's what causes them to open the purse strings. One of the ideas I proposed was to guess genes because I noticed, and I said that same phrase, remember that from before? What if, the way I got to meet Michael Felt? That's another great way to start a conversation with your clients, to get them into the right brain imagination story. What if? I now have a passion and a mission to help as many people like you get off the self-esteem roller coaster of only feeling good about ourselves if our numbers are up and bad about ourselves if our numbers are down. Or only feeling good if things are going the way we want and we're winning awards or bad if we're not. Because once you get off that self-esteem roller coaster, you're going to be more productive because it goes up and down sometimes multiple times in a day, let alone a month or a year. And the key to doing that is realizing that who you are is bigger than anything going on on the outside. And that's what gives you the confidence to face it. Overcoming objections. You don't have the features we want. This isn't the way we want to do it. We're just this is plan in spec mode. We just won't care about who has the cheaper solution. Well, here's one of the ways to handle those kinds of objections. It's called feel, felt, found. And it sounds like this. Well, I understand how you could feel that way. Other clients of ours felt that way at first too. And what they found is, and then you go off into your story of why that worked. Now, what's happening there is you're not agreeing with the objection, but you're letting them know that you heard it. I understand how you could feel that way. Others have felt that way. Other clients have felt that way. Oh, so people felt the same way I do, and they became your client? Yes, because what they found is. I was giving this talk to a group, and a uh, woman raised her hand at the Q&A. She goes, does that feel, felt, found work with dating? And I said, well, give me an example. She's like, well, I met this guy, and we've gone out a couple times, and he wants to go a little faster than I'm willing to go. And uh, what could I say? And I said, well, you could say, look, I understand how you could feel that way, buddy, because other guys have felt the same way. And let's you know, what they found is I'm worth the wait. <laughs> so there's your feel, felt, found, used in a dating situation again that you can apply. I was talking to people about ideas and they said, well, you should start a podcast. And I said, I should go to the moon too. Uh, how do you do that? And I realized I had some fear around it. So I thought, hmm, I'm going to put some faces on this fear so I can identify what it is. And there's literally three faces of fear. The first fear I had was the fear of rejection. What if I ask people to be on the podcast and nobody says yes, because there's no episodes to listen to. They'd be the first. But if you're in sales long enough, you get used to rejection. And for me, what I found is I never take rejection personally. When I was selling ads for W Magazine, someone said, no, we're going with Vanity Fair or this one or that one instead of you. In my head, sometimes I think, ah, maybe somebody else could have done, gotten a yes. Or maybe they're right. Maybe that other company is better than my company. And if you start to let other people's no's affect you personally, you start agreeing with them, then you're taking the rejection personally. So the first solution is if your face is the fear of rejection, don't reject yourself. That concept of being perfect every time you present or if you don't get the sale will drive you crazy. But if you change your mindset and say, I'm not a perfectionist, what I am is a progressionist. 
And that celebrating your progress triggers in your brain, oh, let's have more of that. And that's what keeps you motivated when you're having some challenges in that. And as you heard, I was able to meet Michael Phelps. Well, how the heck did that happen? He's not exactly walking the streets of L.A. I was calling on Speedo when I was selling ads for Connie Nast's W Magazine. And Speedo was coming out with a line of sportswear. And they were planning to advertise it in fitness-type magazines. And I went up to them and I said two words. What if? What if we treated your sportswear like it was high fashion? And we could have a fashion show around a swimming pool at a nice hotel. You could invite Michael Phelps because he's part of your team. You're paying him to be the spokesperson for Speedo. And we could get some press around it. And they did. And I got some advertising that was not in the normal way of getting ads. And so when I met Michael at this event, I said to him, you know, everyone says you're so successful in the water because you're tall and your feet are huge and you've got this lung capacity. I'm guessing there's something else to it. He said, yeah, years ago, my coach said to me, hey, Michael, are you willing to work out on Sundays? Michael said, yeah. He goes, great. We just got 52 more workouts than your competitors because most people take Sundays off. What are you willing to do at Allerton that your competition's not willing to do? That's what's going to set you apart. Start to think of yourself as an artist who tells stories and not just a salesperson. Because when you do that, you might, if you're going to be great at pitching and storytelling, you might as well become the Picasso of pitches. You know, uh, three years ago, I had the opportunity to meet Francoise Gillot, who is the mother of Paloma Picasso. In the 1940s, she was in her 20s and Picasso was in his 60s. And they had this mad love affair, and he painted pictures of her, and they have two children, Claude and Paloma. And when I met her in her New York apartment, she invited me in, and she said, you know, in the 40s there was a shortage of canvases, but our urge to create was so great that we would sometimes paint over our paintings, our masterpieces. And the painting you're looking at on the wall is the fifth one I did. I think my favorite is the third one underneath it. And I thought, wow, no one's ever going to see that. Yet her urge to create was so great. And sometimes in sales, we have to paint over our masterpieces too. We think we've got the masterpiece of Picasso presentations, and then something changes at the client. Our budget's changed. There's someone new in the decision process now. Oh, we've changed. We've got to redo it. So the world needs what you have to offer, which is you and your particular passion. And I want to invite all of you to go out and become salespeople who tell stories and paint a picture that allows you to become the Picasso of pitches. Thanks.